<laughs> All right, you guys, uh, my name is Lewis Reed. I serve as the range ecologist and botanist for Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space. And um, I probably have the funnest job tonight. I've been asked to come in here and give you guys a little uh, introduction and background on some basic grassland ecology um, and really uh, hone in a bit on the conservation significance of these grasslands that you guys have already heard a little bit about. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges in managing that diversity and some of the opportunities we have. And in particular, um, since this is the focus of the policy amendment, I'll be talking a lot about our conservation grazing program. Um, when we talk about diversity, I like to take a few steps back. And I think this point has already been made, but if you take a look at the map of the world here and think about places where you find um, unique biodiversity, things that are found nowhere else on the planet, um, places where you have uh, high levels of species richness or numbers of species relative to the area, um, and places where that diversity might be uh, under immediate threat by our activities. Um, I'm sure you guys can all picture a lot of places across this map. Now, if we take a look at another map, um, this was produced by uh, in, co in cooperation with Conservation International, um, who sought to identify um, the world's biodiversity hotspots, where the top places we can invest conservation effort to protect the world's biodiversity. And this is the map that they produced. And uh, the real take home I want you to get from this is, is what Anna and Kurt have already emphasized, which is that California, the California Floristic Province, is a biodiversity hotspot that's recognized on a global scale. And we all need to take that very seriously uh, because all of us, not just Midpen, but each of you here, are the primary stewards for one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. We have the most decision-making power over that on this global map. The second point I'll make is that um, grasslands are a major part of that biodiversity. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, what you'll see is that they represent a disproportionate uh, level of uh, unique species in our environment. Um, Look at this, look at this coastal grassland in the background here. How many species per square meter do you think are in that picture? I actually happened to calculate that number one time. Um, uh, but if you're not used to thinking about grasslands when you think of biodiversity, maybe you're used to thinking coral reefs and tropical rainforests, here are a few examples. Um, animals like this western burrowing owl, a ground nesting owl that lives in our grasslands. And they uh, don't dig their own burrows. They rely on the activity of other animals like this American badger. These are animals that occur on district rangelands. Um, and the list goes on, this federally listed frog, even native amphibians that occur in our grasslands. Um, and a uh, huge variety of plants, uh, this um, uh, little viola down here that's not actually a rare species in and of itself is the larval host plant to this listed uh, Calippe silver spot butterfly. So here's a few examples, and the list goes on quite extensively. So um, I care a lot about that species richness. It's a lot of what earns us the place on that biodiversity hotspot map, but we should also think about the ecosystem services that those species collectively and their interactions with the environment provide us. They provide a number of things that enhance our well-being. Um, so I'll go over a few examples here. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking about how these ecosystem services take place in our grasslands. Uh, we know that grasslands are uh, an, a major part of terrestrial carbon cycling. And in fact, recent work out of uh, Benjamin Holton's lab at UC Davis indicates that our grasslands are likely a more reliable and stable storage of carbon in our landscape because they, uh, they store more of their carbon below ground relative to their woody counterparts. We know that forests capture a lot of carbon, but they hold that carbon above ground where it's vulnerable to combustion. I should mention too, before I move on here, um, references for some of that information are indicated with numbers here, and at the end I'll have a list of references for folks who are interested in tracking some of that information down. Uh, grasslands are also critical to our watershed function. They comprise a large portion of our landscape, and so it's not difficult to understand that the condition of these grasslands that support, or sorry, that surround this reservoir in Contra Costa County uh, influence both the quantity and quality of water that we're able to capture and ultimately yield into our municipal water supply. And uh, there's been a lot of recent work uh, looking into how we can use livestock to enhance watershed function in grassland systems like this. 
And the last one that I'll mention here, and believe me, we could go on about this, but it's just um, that these places also provide great habitat for us as humans, right? We live in one of the most densely populated parts of the country, and we need to get outside sometimes too. And so whether you like to hike or mountain bike or walk your dog or, or ride a horse, don't you love having those wide open vistas that our grasslands provide um, and seeing those seasonal wildflower blooms that you find there? So a few examples of ecosystem services. Um, I'm going to shift gears here. Hopefully I've really drilled in the conservation significance of these grasslands. We can talk about it more later. Um, but you know, it begs the question of what are the biggest threats to these landscapes? And I'm going to go over a few points here. I think the number one threat is, is large scale land conversion. Urban sprawl um, has covered up a lot of our historic grasslands. Um, intensive agriculture has covered up a lot of our historic grasslands. Um, so th that's sort of the first step. And it's something that the district addresses very well by protecting our preserves, right? But particularly in the case of grasslands, just setting something aside as a preserve is not enough to protect that biodiversity. Uh, another big threat to grassland diversity is altered disturbance regimes. These systems evolved with heavy grazing pressure of our Pleistocene megafauna, um, with, uh, with uh, indigenous burning practices that Kurt mentioned. Um, and so they're, they're actually very much disturbance dependent communities. If we don't have some sort of disturbance regime on the landscape, we can lose them through natural process of succession. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the woody systems that can replace these, but we don't want to entirely lose grasslands from the landscape. And without those historic pressures, we're left to manage these landscapes ourselves. Um, and then the last thing that I'll, I'll mention is just that um, in California in particular, we have a, a high level of pressure from invasive exotic species, again, which requires active management and sort of ongoing management. This grassland in the back, by the way, I don't know if we have any botanists in the room, but this is an incredible example of our native coastal prairie. Um, these little grass stems that are bent over here are California oak grass, um, and those little uh, rust-colored tops there is a western rush. Uh, this is a grazed site uh, just south of Half Moon Bay, and uh, at one time was proposed to be a housing subdivision. Uh, it's fortunately now a preserve, protecting one of our nicest examples of native coastal prairie. So um, if we're going to take care of this biodiversity that's unique to these grasslands, we have to think about where, what are our options for being able to do that? How are we going to create the disturbance regimes that, that maintain open landscapes? And how are we going to manage species composition to maintain that unique biodiversity? Um, so the first option up here is do nothing. That's always an option, right? But I think uh, we've established that um, in the case of grassland conservation, doing nothing is pretty much sentencing this diversity out of existence, right? Um, if we do nothing, we'll lose these, these pieces of our landscape. Um, but there are a variety of other tools that land managers use to, to uh, uh, steward grasslands, things like mowing and other mechanical treatments. Um, the use of prescribed fire continues to be a useful management tool in grasslands, sometimes uh, targeted use of herbicide. And uh, increasingly, we're learning that we can use grazing or conservation grazing um, to protect diversity in these landscapes. And, and really, when you think about the scale that we're managing these grasslands, you know, thousands of acres, um, grazing sort of rises to the surface as maybe one of the most reasonable options for being able, able to meet these objectives at a landscape scale. So uh, what do I mean when I say conservation grazing? Um, the, the real thing I, I want to focus on here is that this is grazing with the aim of protecting natural resources, which is a little bit different than just running a livestock production operation. I think there's a lot of overlap, and I think many of our private lands provide a lot of those same ecosystem services. But on district lands, we're explicitly working with grazing partners to try to meet our conservation goals. And to do that, we have to choose, we have to do a lot of things, um, we have to uh, define a lot of different variables. So what species of livestock do we use? People have asked, well, you know, why don't you just um, reintroduce tule elk to these lands? And uh, I think that's a really interesting prospect, but, but I think it's not a substitute for what we accomplish with the grazing program. We can't really manage a free-ranging herd of tule elk um, to, to meet specific conservation targets. Um, and uh, even within livestock, different kinds of animals have different foraging preferences, different herding behaviors that influence their outcome 
or the, of their uh, effect on the landscape. Uh, we have to decide how many animals are out there, how long they're out there, over what season they're out there, um, and, and all these things determine what the effect of grazing is going to be on the habitat structure. Um, and we have to manage their dispersals. So there's a lot of things we do, like um, fencing off riparian er areas or providing alternate water sources that attract animals to areas where we'd like to have that influence. This picture in the background is one of my favorite places to go see spring wildflowers. This is a, a preserve up in, um, this is the Table Mountain Preserve up in Butte County. And uh, believe it or not, livestock is the main management tool for sustaining this biodiversity. I'm gonna take time for questions a, a little bit later, so we'll come back to that, but don't forget, please. So um, I've got just a little bit of time left here, so I'm gonna speed it up. Mechanistically, here are some of the ways that grazing um, helps, helps us take care of our plants and animals. Um, the first one is just by helping us maintain open grassland habitat, regardless of the composition. Things like this short-eared owl, another grassland owl, quite simply need large areas of open grassland. Um, and grazing can help us accomplish that. Um, the second is maintaining some areas with short-statured grasslands. So it turns out uh, when you, you look at grassland animals, just the height the varying height of vegetation is very important for different species. A number of sensitive species in our grasslands prefer a short statured grassland. Um, things like this little tiny Plantago erecta that grows prolifically on some of our grazed sites and supports this uh, endangered butterfly. Um, aquatic features that we maintain on these sites and the associated vegetation structure that livestock influence are beneficial to animals like this federally listed red-legged frog. Now, really what I mean here is, is talking about pond management, but this was just a really cute picture of a red-legged frog in a cattle trough um, at uh, Lahana Creek Preserve. Um, and then lastly, uh, carefully managed grazing can help us maintain some balance in the tide of exotic invasive grasses that tend to outcompete some of our native species. So here's, a, a, again, for the botanically inc inclined, a uh, dense stand of purple needlegrass and associated wildflowers at uh, Mindigo Hill Ranch, uh, part of the Russian Ridge Preserve that is in our grazing program. So that's a lot about diversity. I'll real quickly touch on some of the other goals of the conservation grazing program, one of which is fuel management. I think this is a pretty straightforward one. Um, here's a couple pictures of uh, grazed and ungrazed grasslands within the district. We have grasslands that can produce around five to 6,000 pounds of dry fuel by the end of the summer. So picture waist high grass. And um, the same conservation targets that we have for our grazing program to meet habitat standards, reduce that fuel down to more on the scale of 2000 pounds per acre or so. So think maybe more like ankle high, knee high grass. Um, so uh, this is a great way to reduce wildfire fire risk on the landscape and very much supported by the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. This is a place where you can read more about stuff like that. Um, and then lastly, I'll touch on this point of our coastal mission that involves supporting local agricultural heritage. And what I see here is that the conservation grazing program is, is really a unique opportunity to work collaboratively with our uh, members of our agricultural community in a way that's mutually beneficial. It supports continued agricultural activity in our, in our district. Um, and these people are able to help us meet our conservation goals by using their livestock as a management tool. So um, that's all I have to share. I'm going to pass this along, but during the transition, I'm going to go ahead and put up. Um, these are some of the references that I used to <laughs> compile this. Sorry to fit them all in here. They're not really small, but if you have questions at the end, I'll be around at the end of the night if you want to talk about any of this. <laughs> I should introduce our next speaker is uh, Dr. Veronica Jovovich, who's going to talk about her literature review on wildlife and livestock. All right. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Veronica Jovovich. I'm a researcher at UC Berkeley. And for years, I was a researcher uh, with the Santa Cruz Puma Project. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about how uh, we developed the literature review and the information that um, MidPen is using to guide the new wildlife and livestock protection policy. So um, as Lewis mentioned, rangelands are really important habitats for wildlife. And California is comprised of over 50% rangeland. So um, the dynamics that are happening at Midpen are playing out across the state. And if we can figure out ways for uh, livestock, 
that are being ranged on rangeland for conservation purposes or for other purposes to be able to live um, in proximity you know, and share spaces with carnivores, we can effectively open up all of this habitat to, uh, to carnivores and promote habitat connectivity across the state. So what's going on at Midpen has the potential to have a very large management footprint across the state as, as other people look to Midpen for guidance on how to prevent conflicts between livestock and carnivores. Midpen has properties that are, um, are part of a matrix of, of lands here in the Central Coast. And as you can see, uh, they're interspersed with other rangelands with different types of management regimes. So in Midpen, if, uh, if we can figure out ways, uh, again, for carnivores and livestock to share space as those carnivores move between protected lands and unprotected lands, they're less likely to run into conflict. If we can teach them how to interact with livestock in a way that's safe for both the carnivores and the livestock, as they move around, they'll take that knowledge with them since, since they have large ranges and, and don't tend to respect property boundaries, and it'll increase their safety. So Midpen has the ability to have a management footprint that reaches beyond Midpen boundaries locally as well as across the state. So knowing that, uh, that Midpen tenants were having some predation issues with carnivores, they wanted to develop this policy. And the first step in that was to talk to their tenants and to see what's going on and get a, a clearer picture. So they surveyed their tenants. And what they found was that tenants were reporting that predation was a significant issue for them for uh, their ranching viability. Um, they ranked it as, as important or critically important to whether they could keep uh, contributing to the conservation grazing program. Most producers reported having more than one loss to carnivores. And some reported having trouble uh, confirming predation events. Midpen properties are very rugged and expansive. And so getting out, uh, detecting car um, carcasses and getting to them in a time frame where uh, you could determine what the cause of death was is very difficult. And this is a problem uh, way beyond Midpen. But that's one of the things that the, the tenants noted was an issue for them. They ranked carnivores in, in order of having the most to least impact, as mountain lions had the most impacts on their livestock, coyotes, and then domestic dogs. So wanting to do their homework, uh, Midpen looked around to see what other agencies were doing so that they could borrow tools. They didn't want to reinvent the wheels. Um, so they looked around to, to other local agencies, and what they found was that most local agencies don't have any formal policy guiding livestock losses. Um, many handle it, most handle it, on a case-by-case -case basis. Now some local land management agencies do allow lethal and non-lethal tools, and some uh, use preemptive reduced rent as a way uh, to compensate uh, producers for restrictive policies. Some uh, allow non-lethal prevention only, um, and only one uh, agency actually had a formalized policy. So the county of Marin had a, a cost share program and compensation program. The compensation program was similar to Midpens, um, but it was disbanded a few years ago because it was too expensive. And right now they continue to have a cost share program where producers can uh, get deterrence, uh, some of the costs for deterrence defrayed by the, by the county. So we're gonna walk through a bunch of different tools that are available for, for use on mid pen lands. But before we go through the tools, we're gonna go through a guide here, a little icon guide. So each tool has the silhouette of each of our three uh, primary carnivores of concern. And each of those will be color coded to tell you how that tool, how that carnivore and the tool interact. So a green icon means that that tool is effective against that carnivore. Yellow is moderately effective. Red is not effective. Green with a kind of weird red halo is that results vary. And uh, gray with a question mark means there's no data. So there's, there's been no research, nothing's been tested with that tool and that carnivore. So by far and away, the most effective tool is night penning. 
Um, this is when you've got your livestock in an, a fully enclosed structure, so four sturdy walls and a sturdy roof and a door that you, sh you shut each and every night with your livestock on the inside. And that is hands down the most effective tool with all carnivores. But um, unfortunately, this is also completely impractical for on a rangeland setting and with cattle. Removing attractants is also very effective with all of the, the carnivores that we're interested in. So this is uh, if you have livestock that die for whatever reason, you remove that carcass. Um, there are logistic hurdles for this, but it's, it's, it's relatively effective with all of our carnivores. Um, now, this is likely best used in concert with other tools, but um, keep this in mind as we go forward. Altering production calendars, so calving and fawning are uh, calving at the same time of year as uh, native ungulates are fawning and calving uh, is a good strategy. It's moderately effective, as you can say, but this introduces a lot of economic uh, penalties to ranchers that we can go over in the question section if anybody wants to chat about this. Livestock guardian animals are also uh, a pretty effective tool. So as you can see, livestock guardian dogs in particular are effective with each of the carnivores of concern, and it's highly effective. Um, the things that you'd want to keep in mind are it's, uh, the, or some of the benefits are that they're effective on all spatial scales, so small operations uh, up to large scale operations. They work with any livestock species. And they also keep, help keep livestock together, which in and of itself is, is a predation deterrent. So there, there's multiple fronts that livestock guardian uh, dogs provide benefits. Some key things to keep in mind are that not all dogs are suitable to be livestock guardian dogs. Um, some of them don't have the right temperament, and so it does require some, some experimenting. They also need to be properly trained. So this uh, is a pretty big hurdle for livestock producers that involves a lot of, uh, of investment on the, the livestock producer's part. There's also special considerations for running livestock guardian dogs on public land where you have public access. We have hikers and mountain bikers and things like that coming through. Uh, donkeys can also be a, a relatively good tool, depending on the carnivore that you're dealing with. So it, there's, um, there's different risk in the environment, right? And some producers have more issues with mountain lions and some have more issues with coyotes. So if you're a producer that has issues with domestic dogs or coyotes, this could be a really good choice for you. Um, they tend to be cheaper to maintain than livestock guardian dogs, um, but they can be aggressive to young, uh, to your calves. So people tend to remove them when they're calving, which is the time of year when you probably most want a livestock guardian animal present. Llamas can also be a good tool depending on what it is that you're dealing with. So if, if domestic dogs are your biggest issue, uh, then they're a good tool. They're less effective with coyotes, and I've heard that they're not at all effective with mountain lions. I've had uh, producers say they get in the middle of your sheep and point out the slow uh, sheep to the mountain lion for, for them to pick off. <laughs> Fencing is another uh, traditional option, and as you can see from the variety of colors we've got here, uh, it really depends on the type of fence that you're using. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that any fence that's good enough to exclude carnivores altogether uh, is likely going to be good enough to also exclude uh, any other wildlife, and so that's going to remove that, that conservation value to some degree of that habitat. So they're best to use probably on a small scale or uh, temporarily. There's a new class of tools, these frightening deterrents. And the idea here is that carnivores, like many animals, like a predictable environment. And these different deterrents uh, create novel stimuli that make them uncomfortable. Again, these are probably best used on a small spatial scale uh, or um, temporarily, because uh, carnivores can habituate to these tools. And um, I don't have enough time to go into like a lot of detail about any of these, but I'm very happy to talk about all these things in great detail later. The next class of tools is human activity. Uh, so hazing and increasing human presence. We're gonna focus first on increased human presence. This could be like a, a range rider program or range monitoring program where you have volunteers come out and patrol. Uh, these, these volunteers, provide an extra eyes and ears on the ground to report uh, sick and injured livestock. 
Um, they can also monitor carnivore presence. They can check for uh, sign or monitor uh, game cameras. They can also contribute non-technical support. So they can shuttle supplies or uh, recognize if a fence is down or if there are other things going on and report that to the producer so that they can address those concerns. And they can also help if you have non-lethal deterrence like some of the ones from the last slide. Some key points to remember is that volunteers are likely gonna be out there during the day and carnivores tend to be more active at night. So you'd have to design a program to address that concern. You'd also want to make sure that their schedule wasn't very predictable so that the carnivores uh, saw the human presence as something uh, unpleasant to deal with and, and that they couldn't just get used to. Also, carnivores can be kind of anywhere and your volunteer is only in one place. So the, um, you'd want to figure out ways to sort of broadcast human presence. Hazing is uh, another tool that has been very effective with coyotes in some places. We don't know what, whether it would work with mountain lions and there's no data on domestic dogs either. The idea behind hazing is basically you're, you're teaching uh, the carnivores how to interact with people. You're making, you're making them realize that people are not something that they want to be around and you're, you're, kind of, you're being scary. So some key things to remember is that it's very effective with coyotes. It's unknown for mountain lions. Um, and you're preventing undesirable habits from forming. So the, the best thing, way to implement a hazing uh, practice is early on before problematic behaviors have developed. It's very hard to use hazing once uh, you already have a, a problem animal that's developed undesirable behaviors. This can also extend some of the, the management benefits beyond mid pen. If you teach people if you teach carnivores that people are scary, they'll learn that carnivores are scary and they'll apply that to anywhere, not just mid-pen property. It's also highly adaptable to the context. Because you have a person there uh, performing the hazing activity, you can tweak it really easily and, and make it very responsive to the situation. Then there's some other tools uh, that I'm not gonna go into because there's really no data on their efficacy. So we're gonna skip right over that. And one thing that you might notice from the last slide and from some of the previous slides is that uh, there's really, we need more research on this. And there are a bunch of groups that are doing local mountain lion research and let local other carnivore, coyote and other carnivore research that could be appropriate homes uh, to do more research at Midpen and in other places and really help inform some of these practices. I wanna emphasize a cooperative extension on this one. They're in the process right now of hiring somebody, a human wildlife conflict advisor, whose job it would be uh, to study these things in this area, in San Mateo County and uh, the well, Bay Area counties in general. So uh, this will be coming soon and that'll be very exciting to fill in some of those gaps. So just to kind of wrap up, some components for a successful program would include uh, some low hanging fruit. So you choose the tools that are easy to implement first. Uh, like removing attractants, or, or at least straightforward to implement. Um, this could be a good step in the right direction with other tools as well. Every operation is unique, and so the tools involved to protect livestock on that operation need to be tailored specifically to meet uh, that context. The best kind of program will have multiple strategies. Carnivores are out there 24 seven and, uh, and they, they're smart and they're adaptive. And so you need the tools to be adaptive uh, to match what uh, their skill set is basically. And you're gonna wanna vary those tools so they don't get used to, to one tool and then they're able to overcome it. And the last thing is we need more research to be able to inform what we can do and what's effective where. So similar to Lewis's slide, um, here are some references for you to just read real quick right now. Um, and we can talk about these uh, at any point in the evening. And with that, I think Matt, you're up next. Yeah. All right, thank you, Veronica. And uh, thank you, Lewis, for, for setting things up. Um, as usual, you both make my job a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, my name is Matt Sharp Cheney, and I'm a resource management specialist with Midpen Open Space District in the wildlife program. And uh, when I meet people at parties, I say that I'm a wildlife biologist because that makes more sense than resource management specialist. Um, but that is my focus, um, and I particularly focus quite a bit on mammals, um, including mountain lions and many bat species. 
so the bat that popped up on the screen earlier in the presentation was a, bat, a picture of a Townsend's Big Eared Bat that I took myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today to talk with you all about a project that I've been working on for some time now, which is amending this grazing management policy uh, to address the issue of wildlife and livestock conflict. Um, and I want to recognize again that this is a controversial issue that elicits a lot of emotion from many people, including myself. Um, but the emotion that I'd like to uh, express to you today is, is actually one of excitement. Um, I think that MidPen is in a very good position to implement some proactive measures to try and deal with this problem, um, not only uh, to benefit MidPen preserves, but the region as a whole. Um, so I'm very excited to be here to have this conversation with you all um, about how to better protect wildlife and livestock um, together. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about why conflict puts predators at risk. I'm going to talk about what our grazing program uh, is composed of. I'm going to talk about our existing resource management policies. So what, what are the policies that we're talking about? What do these policies dictate? Um, what do they do for us as a district? And then I'll get into details about the actual grazing policy amendment. So to start, uh, reducing conflicts do protect native predators. Um, I want to really emphasize that. And to, to uh, put a point on it, um, <clears throat> I will give you a little background information about the mountain lion population as we, as we know it in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There's not a lot of great information about the number of mountain lions in the region, but a recent study suggested that there was 33 to 66 adult mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountain region. Um, there's a, another study coming out from Fish and Wildlife that we're actually working with them on that may have a more accurate number in the next couple of years, um, but this gives you an idea, 33 to 66 adult lions. Uh, while mountain lions are a specially protected mammal in the state of California, it is actually legal to lethally remove them if they are attacking or have attacked domestic animals, including pets or livestock. Um, in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz counties, which are the three counties that make up the Santa Cruz Mountains, from 2008 to 2018, a total of 42 mountain lions were legally killed um, through the use of depredation permits uh, because of conflict between them and domestic animals. And that's a total of 133 permits issued. Not all permits results in a lion being taken, um, but that's 133 confirmed instances of uh, conflict between these uh, beautiful predators and livestock. Um, UCSC Puma Project, Dr. Chris Wilmers uh, mentioned to me that legal depredation is actually one of the leading causes of mortality in, uh, for mountain lions in the region, just behind impacts from vehicles. And in addition to these legal lethal takes, um, we are aware that there is illegal poaching um, also taking place in response to these conflicts. So conflict does put predators at risk. In addition, it also puts our conservation grazing program at risk. So we've been collecting data on the total number of confirmed losses uh, to predator species in the district since 2013, when we started actually reimbursing tenants uh, for those confirmed losses. We're one of the only organizations in the area that does this. And the way that we look at it is, if you are, say, doing some yard work and you're borrowing a weed whacker from your neighbor, and you break it uh, in the middle of doing that yard work, well, you should probably replace or repair that thing. So uh, what we're doing with this reimbursement is making sure that the tools that we're using, the cattle that we use to uh, implement our conservation grazing goals are replaced if they're taken by a native predator. Uh, we have 22 animals total that we know of that have been taken. Um, and if you look at that district-wide, the average percent loss is 0.5. 72%, which is not very high on a district-wide scale. But of course, uh, these impacts are not felt uh, district-wide, they're felt on an individual basis for our individual tenants. And what's important to note here is that uh, the average loss on district lands is higher than the state average. So we have some great mountain lion habitat and um, 
we at the district are lucky enough to get to manage 65,000 acres of that habitat. The Santa Cruz Mountains is a great location for mountain lions. In terms of the habitat itself, however, it is very fragmented and isolated, which leads to issues with genetic depression. We also manage a large majority of the grazing area in the San Mateo County Coast, around 33%, 8,500 acres. And that means that what we do has an impact beyond our scope. So if we have a program that's successful, it's likely that private livestock operators may be interested in that and want to know more about it. In addition, other resource agencies that have conservation grazing programs are definitely paying attention to how this policy proceeds. If we're successful and make a policy that works, this will be noted and hopefully there will be more similar policies moving forward to address this issue. So to give you a little information about what our conservation grazing programs consist of, we have seven conservation grazing ranchers that we work with on 10 separate properties. These range in size from 270 acres to nearly 4,000 acres. These are very wide uh, ranging, uh, large pastures in rough mountainous terrain. And the stocking capacity on a property basis is from 20 head of cattle to a high of 193 and district wide around 550 to 600 cattle is what we currently have. So now that you have a little background about what our grazing program is about, um, let's talk about what these resource management policies are about. That's what we're here to discuss. Um, policies that we have at the district really are a, a high level definition of how we manage resources. So they set up a framework, they offer a, a toolkit for staff and our board to make decisions about how we can best manage resources. And in addition, they offer an opportunity for us to inform the public about our intentions uh, like we're doing today. So we have a, a specific resource management mission statement. I won't read it out loud for you, but um, essentially what it is is protecting and restoring the natural environment, which is part of our mission statement. Then I'll call out specifically um, some components of this resource management uh, policy, which include wildlife, vegetation, water, grazing management, as well as others. I'll focus on these in particular because they have a, a greater impact on how we manage our grazing lands. Our wildlife policy's goal is to maintain and promote healthy and diverse native wildlife populations. Our vegetation policy goal, promote viable and diverse native plant communities. Our water policy, protect and restore natural water courses. And the reason I'm telling you about all of these is that I want everyone to be aware that we need to look at and consider all of our policies in concert when we're making any management decision. We can't ignore one um, and focus only on the other. So with this policy that we're putting together, uh, we're wanting to make sure that it doesn't conflict with any other policies. So this brings us to our grazing management policy uh, goal. Um, this, this is the existing policy. We already have this policy in place and what we're working on is an amendment. Then you can see echoes of those other goals from those other policies here. Um, protect natural resources, uh, maintain and enhance the diversity of native plant and animal communities. But what we don't have here as a goal is manage conflict between wildlife and livestock, which is why we're working on the amendment. So the goal of the amendment is ensuring the sustainability, both economically and ecologically, of conservation grazing areas in areas where predation of livestock may occur. And this photo uh, set right down here is from a wildlife camera that we have out at Russian Ridge. And it really illustrates a point that the majority of the time, um, cattle and wildlife are not in conflict. Uh, these, these two species, the mountain lion and the, and the cow here, um, are in the same area at separate times and are not in conflict. But occasionally there are conflicts and that's why we need to address them to protect both cattle and wildlife. So there's three components of the policy that I'm gonna go through very quickly. Um, number one is economics. So I'm gonna use uh, an example here from one of our grazing tenants, Ronnie Seaver, who manages uh, the grasslands with us out at Mindigo Hill, which is one of my favorite places that I get to work, where we have a, a healthy population of San Francisco garter snake and California red-legged frog. 
Now, Ronnie was kind enough to give us some personal information about his operation and the finances of his operation. Um, and we see here that the market price for a calf is about $850. And Ronnie's annual expenses for running this operation is about $26,000. And that includes rent and inoculations and pregnancy uh, impregnations for cattle, those sorts of things. Now, Ronnie has about 40 calves a year that are yielded from his, uh, his efforts. In a perfect scenario, he'd make about $7,000 for managing uh, this landscape with us for an entire year by running cattle there, which is not a huge amount of money. If he had a 5% loss, he'd make about 5,000. And with a 22% loss, he would be in the red. And this is actually something that occurred in 2018. He did have a 22% loss, which really puts that partnership that we have with him in jeopardy. And he had to think long and hard about whether he could continue to work with us. Uh, Two of those calves that were lost, um, we know were from coyotes, but as is often the case, the majority of them, we weren't able to make that determination. So we don't know what the entirety of that loss is from. Um, this, I think I just want to point out that these losses are not felt proportionately. And I went over that a little bit before, but uh, on an individual basis for individual grazing tenants, losses range from anywhere from 0%. Some people have no losses at all in a given year and as high as almost 7%. Um, so I'd like, I'd usually just imagine what I would feel like if 7% of my income um, was lost for some reason and how much that would impact me. Um, and you know, we realize that this is significant for individual tenants. Now, if we're looking at alternatives to grazing, some of the methods that Lewis mentioned earlier, um, I'll just real quickly note that last year we spent about $238,000 on conservation grazing, which sounds like a good chunk of money, <clears throat> but if you compare it to the cost per acre of other methods, um, you realize that it's actually very much so the most economically viable solution for us to manage landscapes at the scale that we do. Um, and as an example, uh, we've, we've put together a hypothetical breakdown of how we might manage that 7,600 acres of actively grazed lands uh, with different methods, um, making up different percentages, and realize that we would spend about $17 million if we were to use mowing, prescribed fire, and brush cutting, and the biological monitors that would be needed to uh, implement those successfully without harming San Francisco garter snake and red-legged frog and things like that that we want to protect. So this is a, the draft language, and I won't go into specifics on this, but just call out that what we're looking at here is providing relief for our tenants that are using non-lethal protection measures. So they're actively trying to dissuade predators from taking livestock. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And they're also documenting the total losses to predators as well as other factors, which we'll use to uh, inform our management decisions moving forward. The way that we're uh, intending on helping our grazing tenants and helping this partnership is by reducing our AUM or rent rate and by increasing our reimbursement amount to cover the potential value of an animal lost rather than the value of the animal at the time that it is lost. All right, so the second component is the wildlife and livestock protection component, which is really the heart of this policy. And what we're talking about here is what Veronica um, detailed in her presentation. So we are trying to reduce conflicts, safeguard wildlife and conservation grazing, select methods for, that work for each operation, and develop a protocol for detailing how we implement those methods. So these are some of the methods as a reminder that we are considering. Um, I will touch briefly on hazing um, and note that hazing would only be allowed in response to loss of livestock. We wouldn't authorize hazing if a mountain lion or coyote was just on the landscape in area where cattle are. Um, we want these predators on the landscape. We recognize that they are a very important part of a healthy eco ecology, um, but hazing would, would only be allowed in response to loss. Uh, we are looking at developing a pilot project for livestock monitoring to try and help with that issue of uh, cattle being lost but not being discovered quickly enough to determine the cause of loss. And then the final component of the policy is research. So we're looking at supporting 
scientific research on wildlife and livestock conflicts, and using that research to modify our methods based on what we find. So the things that we're looking at are how effective are deterrence, how effective is changing livestock operations, um, can we identify habituated predators, um, what are the impacts of deterrence on non-target species of wildlife and cattle. And with that, I would like to conclude by just uh, again thanking you all for being here during this uh, busy holiday season, and I want to invite you all to continue to have this important conversation. Um, we have many upcoming meetings. Uh, late February, we'll have a Planning and Natural Resources Committee meeting on this topic, and I invite all of you to come, and uh, if, if you'd like to, to speak, you'll be given an opportunity to speak directly to our board. We'll have additional meetings and also a CEQA review period from May through June, where you can direct uh, comments through our CEQA. Um, so this conversation um, is controversial, is emotional, but it is very exciting. And I think that uh, we have a great opportunity here um, to do something that, that has a larger impact that, that um, extends beyond just mid-pen preserves and protects both wildlife and livestock. So thank you all for being here to help us have this conversation. Um, here are my uh, site, sources cited. Now, they're not quite as many. Um, but with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over again to Sheila Berry. And uh, I will just point out, if people do have specific questions for anybody that presented today, we will be available after the small uh, group sessions at the back of the, um, the room here. And you can come up and talk to us directly. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, we also have a comment cards. Um, by the welcome table, and you can submit comment cards and we'll, we'll reply to those. So with that, we'll let Sheila go up. So we're going to have about a 10 minute break, and, and then we're going to move to our small groups. Um, so, and you'll have a facilitator in your group that will guide you through uh, four discussion um, topics. And so I want to make sure you know where to go after our break. And so we'll end our break at, I think, 7.25. You'll report to your room. So groups one through three will be in the Redwood Hall, and that's here. Groups four and five will be in the Elm Room. That's four and five in the Elm Room. Um, and six and seven in the Cedar Room. And eight and nine will be in the uh, Willow Room. Um, I also want to point out that there is a comment box that's available at the front of the hall um, where the person's waving their hand there in the back if you feel like you want to write a question or a comment. Um, so yeah, you will report to your um, group at 725 and then um, um, after that we'll be rejoining back here and have the groups report back. So um, pizza in the back and restrooms as well. So.